Okay, so at this moment in time, you're probably considering what if your graph gets really, 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 really big and having the actual physical rep visual representation of the graph and then finding the shortest um, path, isn't that going to be complicated? And this is when we bring up the fact that we can perform Moore's breadth first search via our JCT matrices. In other words, we can have just the representation of the graph, which is in matrices, and we can search through that matrix to get the breadth first search coming out of it, the Moore's breadth first search to be exact. So how do we do this? Let's first just draw a graph and go from there, get its adjacency matrix and then show you the process by thinking about how what exactly the adjacency matrix represents. So step one, let's just draw a graph. Let's do a simple one at the moment. An upside down house and then just add some lines there a b c d e f and g so remember when we did adjacency matrices you have your a your b your c your d your e your f and your g and your a your b your c d e f and g and you put a one wherever there is an edge between them and a zero where the edge isn't Okay, so let's just go ahead and do that. Again, I'm doing it in this long approach. You should by now be very comfortable drawing up this adjacency matrix. So you may actually want to freeze the video and just double check that you can do this. Okay, so then we have an A. We have no loops, so all of these should be zero. Then we have A, B. And we have A, B. And remember, when you look at this, particularly if it's a simple graph, it should be symmetric, the matrix. E. So then we have AC, nothing, AD, we have stuff. Now we've, and then we can go AD. So this should be done, and this should be done. Then we look at B. B is connected to A. We've already got that one covered. B is connected to E. B is connected to E. B is connected to C. B is connected to C. Is B connected to anything else? No. So we can actually finish this row and finish this column. Okay, then we can go on to C. C is connected to B. That's already handled. What else is C connected to? F. C is connected to F. And we can then finish up that row in that column and move on to D. So D is connected to A. That's already covered. We've already done it. Then we can look at what else is D connected to? D is connected to E. And D is connected to G. And we can finish up that row and column. So that E and G, that's done. Now we look at E. E is already done. You've really shown everything connected up until D. So we just have to look F and G. It's connected to F, not connected to G. Connected to F, not connected to G. Then we look at F. F is connected. Well, we've already covered most of it. We just have to look at G. And we just have to look at G, and then we're done. Okay, so there is our adjacency matrix. E. And I'm just going to take away all those lines. And now remember the whole idea behind Moore's breadth first search is that it looks for the adjacent matrices and activates those that haven't already been activated. So I'm going to do this via the graph and via the matrix e as you go about this, just so that you can get an idea so you can start seeing what the adjacency matrix e represents and how you can utilize it for Moore's breadth first search. So let's start with matrix e, well, let's start with vertex B. So that is our initial vertex. Right. So if we're looking at vertex B, we would then look for the adjacent vertices. So in this case, it would be A, C, and E. Okay, so we have that. So let's look at how we could look for that just looking at our adjacency matrix. So we know that your rows and your columns are representing your vertices. So let's just put this back for a second. B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay. So what we can do is is we take B, right? And I want to put this in the same color. So we have B. 
and we know for a fact we need to look at all the vertices adjacent to b we know we can cancel that one out we don't really care about that one so we know we need to look at in this case a c and e so we have those and we activate those so we activate those a c and e and we get rid of their rows so now we have a c and e active then we look at their vertices um, their adjacent vertices so in this case we start with a we start off you know because it's an alphabetical order and we have an adjacent matrices written so we have a b c d e it makes our life a little bit easier so there we have our d and we're then going to activate d that will you know happen but that row will be gone so then we look at c we activate our f and that row will be gone then we have our G, we look at our, where else can it, well, we've done C, we've done E, is does E have anything left for us to look at? No. So then we move on to the purple. And once we look at the purple, we basically go through this whole process and we say, okay, A is nothing, B is nothing, C is nothing, oh look, D. So then we activate G and we cross out G. And once all that's done, in other words, we have all those different, you know, columns, activated and all our rows are cancelled out we're done and I did it in color but you can also have written that out so let's just make sure by checking the graph so I remember I started the graph and then I moved completely on to the matrices so there we had at B and then we had A, C and E were activated then when we looked at our matrices we said oh look we started with A now looking at A and we activate D and that makes sense because we do it via alphabet and then we're supposed to look through C and E. And we looked at C, we had F occurring. And then we looked at E, and E had none, you know, available to us. It was, you know, all those lines basically and just didn't have that light blue line. So then we moved on. We moved on to D and F. And essentially we just scrolled through our columns to look for whenever g popped up it popped up there so we had g active with d so we could get our depth first our breadth first surge from our adjacency matrix so let's just do another example because i'm well aware that this is like a bit confusing okay so for the next example i'm going to work straight from the adjacency matrix you can pause to draw the matrix first or to draw the graph first actually so that you can match up what I'm going to do via just the adjacent matrix C to see that it actually does work and does make sense. Okay, so remember you can pause it and you can draw the graph to see and double check but I'm going to be working just from the adjacent C matrix C. So one of the things to remember from the adjacent C matrix C, remember every row and every column is connected to a vertex. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Okay, next up, I'm going to basically ask for from C. So I'm going to look for the eccentricity of C. So we're looking at for EC. In other words, we're going to find the longest, shortest path from C. So we're going to activate C. Okay activate C we remove its row so we have C sitting here now and it's just we're just going to do it like that so now we look for all the adjacent vertices to C which haven't been activated already so in that case it's B it's E and it's G so it's B it's E and it's G so let's just do that and we have that situation so this is level 0 and that is level one. So now we activate B, E, and G. So we have, sorry, I highlighted the wrong one there. We activate B, so we take the column B, and we scratch out row B. 
We also activate E, which means we scratch out row E. And we activate G, which means we scratch out row G. And now we look at B. And we look for all the inactive vertices which are adjacent to B, and we activate them. So we're looking at row B, and we say, oh, sweet, we have D. So we have this situation occurring. So D is going to be activated, which means D is going to be crossed out. So we cross out D. We will be activating it there, but we first move on to our E. And then we look at our column E. Does it have any adjacent vertices that aren't already active? In other words, anyone where there is no lines crossed out. In this case, we just have 0, 0. And wait, we have H, which is 1. So again, it's in the light green level. So we have, we have H, H, and so we cross out H there, and we're going to activate H there. But next up, we look at G. So if we look at G, again, we look for anything that is not already active. In other words, we look for ones in that column. We don't have any, so we can just move on. So we move on to our D and our H. But remember, that's level two. Right. So next up, we're going to look at our D and look for any active vertices. And we have no ones there that aren't already striked through, so we just move on to H. So move on to H, and H has, uh, let's choose a color, purple. We have A. And then, so we activate A, and we cross out that row. And then we look further down and we say, oh, look, there's another one there. There's F. So we have F. So we cross that out and we activate F. Now, when we look at that, we see all our columns are active and all our rows are crossed out, which means we're done. So when we look at this, the eccentricity of C in this graph, the E of C is equal to 3. Let's just do a few checks of our previous work. So what is the transversal order of this breadth first search? It is C, B, E, G, D, H, A, F. So that's your transversal order. You have all your different levels. So you have 0, 1, 2, 3. So you have your eccentricity of C is 3. If I had to look at this now, I can also ask for what is the distance from C to H? So D, C, H. And there you can easily work it out to be 2 by just reading from your tree diagram that you drew up here. So remember also when you're performing breadth first search, it creates a spanning tree of your graph. So when you're performing Moore's breadth first search, it gives lengths to your levels and allows you to see the shortest path lengths from your initial or your root vertex to any other vertex in your graph. And your eccentricity is the longest of the shortest paths. In other words, it is your final level that you're looking at. And again, your transversal order is just like when you did your breadth first search. You can get it straight from your matrices. And yes, you can do this with breadth first search as well, not just with Moore's breadth first search. And is there anything else we need to cover here? No, that's pretty much it. Please go draw that graph that from the adjacency matrices to just double check to confirm. One, it's going to give you some really good practice to actually make sure that you can draw the graph from an adjacency matrix. But it's also a case so that you can see and link up to what is happening. And you can slowly start seeing that, hey, your adjacency matrix is very useful. You didn't need to see the graph in order to find out what the eccentricity is, the shortest path lengths are, anything like that. As long as you understand what the adjacency matrix represents, you can utilize it for your algorithms and so on, which is going to be very useful when you reach computer science kind of a situation.